<laughs> Very much so. <sighs> Welcome. I am so, so excited today to welcome Crystal Froberg to the podcast. She is a dear friend and community leader in our local community. And Crystal is a yoga teacher, a massage therapist, and owner of Honey Bloom Bakery. She's led wellness classes, trainings, and retreats worldwide over the last decade. Crystal believes that yoga is the practice of love and can be experienced through the beauty of nature and in everyday sweetness. In her classes, she invites you to come home to your own innate beauty. Her offerings, whether it's a class or a delicious cake, welcome all to reignite the joy in your heart, flow into harmony, and build a sanctuary in your body. So sweet to have you here today, Crystal. Thank you for having me, ladies. I'm honored. And you and Kate have known each other for such a long time now. I such mean, a long time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. See you um, a little. Yeah, for sure. So Kate and I grew up along the same uh, beach and the same sand and waters over near Normandy Beach, uh, New Jersey. And as, as babies, as children, we didn't necessarily know each other, but we were living these like parallel lives right along the shore. And I guess in our later teens, early 20s, we were working together at a restaurant um, and we kind of connected then. And then maybe not until I would say 10 years later, did we really become super close, started teaching yoga around the same time. Um, I worked at some of Kate's different spaces that she's had. And then we started doing some workshops and retreats together. And I'm just so grateful. Kate also has helped me on my healing journey with all of the different uh, women's wellness work that she does as well. So super grateful. Yes, we were destined to be um, sisters of healing in this lifetime for sure. And Jeanette, I've known you for almost maybe about the same time, at least since I've been teaching over the last decade, we've always crossed paths and we're of the same community and, and you know, all three of us have that same mission in our hearts to really help and, and, and heal the world the best way that we can. Yeah. So we're lucky to know and have each other in that way. It's been special to watch your journey, Crystal, as a friend over the years, getting to know you on deeper levels and then your journey and how you've opened up and, and shared yourself with the world in, in different ways and have evolved due to so many life occurrences and circumstances and openings and closings and it's really living your living your work and just embodying what you're teaching is what you're living and what you're living is what you're teaching. There's no way that we can't, right? <laughs> Over the years, um, I've realized that what I have been through, the, the highest of highs and the lowest of lows have made me the teacher and the, and the person that I am, you know, with the students over the years, with clients and with my family and friends. So yes, riding those crazy waves, <laughs> crazy, beautiful waves. So yoga as a practice, you know, in, in terms of how long you've been practicing and now teaching, how has that shifted throughout those kind of waves of life? Yeah, so it's funny because I recently rejoined um, the gym that I first ever took a yoga class in. And it's very sweet to be in that space. They actually asked me to start teaching there, which is just so funny <laughs> and complete 20 years later. Uh, it was Tom, Tom's River Fitness, right on Route 37. And it's like a family owned business. So that's even sweeter. So yeah, um, when I was 19, my dad uh, tragically passed away and I was, you know, looking for something, right? And I grew up very uh, religious and, you know, Christian and with Jesus in my heart. But at that time I was like, I just kind of, all my beliefs just went out the window with the grief that I had and the trauma of, of losing him. <clears throat> And so I walked into the Tom's River Fitness where I used to go like lift weights and run on the treadmill. And I heard this beautiful music and I saw some like candles up the stairs and I just kind of followed the lavender scent <laughs> and like the, maybe it was singing bowls or something of that nature. And I took my first yoga class about 20 years ago and it changed my life. I felt something in my nervous system that I, I didn't know that I could feel. Um, and with that, I continued to practice at the gym. 
And eventually about 10 years later, after a few, um, you know, traveling experiences around the world, I decided to become a yoga teacher because I knew what it was doing for me um, and, and the grief that I had in my heart. And so I moved out to San Francisco. Um, I was actually traveling there the year before that and just came across again. I feel like yoga was always just calling me in, right? Just the sounds, the sights, the colors of the practice. And I stumbled upon a beautiful studio called The Laughing Lotus. And my teacher, Keith Borden at the time, was um, playing Amazing Grace on the harmonium. And that was my dad's favorite song. So I said, okay, dad, I, I hear you. I'll move out here like a, you know, on a whim and study to teach yoga. So that's, you know, it was probably one of the most life-changing experiences that I've ever had to move to a big city, not really know anyone. And I found myself in that yoga studio at least three times a day, <laughs> taking classes and learning from my teachers. <clears throat> And um, along, you know, along the journey of the last 10 years, as I've been teaching, I even learned so much more about the practice that I just, I never knew. And that is the beauty of a really good yoga teacher training. And I'm very blessed that I got to study with people that really uh, were well-versed in, in the real practices of yoga and that were really living it as well. So I'm so, so grateful for that. And each training that I took over the years led me to the next one. Right, studied with um, a beautiful man. His name is Sean Johnson, and um, he's out of New Orleans. And right after Hurricane Sandy, he actually came up to do a benefit concert for us in uh, Long Branch for for the state of New Jersey and, and the and the Jersey Shore because he had been through the Hurricane Katrina. So he wanted to raise some money for us because he's such an empathetic man. So anyhow. Yes, I've studied in Colorado, New York City with some of some of the greatest teachers I feel like that are that are out there today. And I'm just really thankful that through my own practice, I was able to just become a teacher that was real, you know, and not um, gosh, I don't even know what to say about other things I'm thinking at the moment, <laughs> but just, you know, um, in my heart. And there were times where, you know, I had lost a friend to suicide a couple years ago and the whole community knew her and I'm, I'm you know, in the class and we're, we're all crying, right? And so there was nothing, nothing to hide, right? And I don't think that, you know, yoga, um, or I should say, I don't think we should take the emotion out of, out of yoga, even though we're trying to quiet our minds and find our hearts and connect with spirit. I think it's so important to bring everything you're going through right to your mat, you know, and there are some teachers that say, just leave it at the door. I say, bring it. <laughs> right. Yeah. So. And that's something that I've just respected you from the outsider perspective, even knowing you as deeply as I do, that you, you remind each of us to do that in our own ways and that yoga really is the essence of, of living and how much your emotions, your energetics flow through in a way that all the different populations that you've served with guiding practices and even all that you've been doing this summer, which I'd love for you to, to share on the farm. It's really, you're holding up the level of integrity of showing up and not putting on the stoic front or suppressing anything because we know what happens when we suppress how it then catches up and it stays in our tissues and our cells and you're such an advocate for living your practice which has been such a, a graceful way of watching you on the journey thank you that means a lot you know i think that with the modern yoga world there's a lot of um spiritual bypassing that can happen and in a way, I feel as though maybe there was a moment I was in that too, right? But most of the time, yoga would bring me back to a place in my heart if I had gone too far. And I also feel like it can be such a, like a nervous system soother if it's being taught in, in the right way, right? I feel like there's also times and in, in certain teachers that don't necessarily respect the practices in a way 
and especially these days and, and learning from you lately, Jeanette, um, yoga that is trauma informed, right? And maybe, you know, some of us missed that for a little while and didn't know that's what we should be teaching or what we needed, right? And I think mine in a way, even though I wasn't officially trained in trauma yoga, when I look into it, I'm like, well, I think I'm doing that in a way that I'm grateful that my body knew just to do, to consider everyone in the class, to consider all ranges of emotions, to consider that not everyone's just gonna close their eyes and think of a pretty place and feel joy. That's not realistic sometimes, right? Maybe, don't, maybe people don't even wanna close their eyes because that's scary, right? So I think being authentic in that way and holding true to my own traumas and teaching from that place of um, realness and grief and joy is something that um, it almost happened accidentally, if that makes sense. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, I love that, Crystal. It's true, though. I think that true yoga, authentic yoga, is inherently trauma informed, as it is a practice grounded in ahimsa, in non harming, and a practice uh, that brings us into greater states of awakening and awareness where all of you is welcome. Nothing is pushed away or you know, suppressed or pushed down. And that is the authentic practice. So we in the West need to teach trauma informed yoga because so many of us are brought to yoga through a means that include, you know, a lack of authenticity in the practice, so gaslighting, spiritual bypassing, somatic dominance, all of these themes are very prevalent. And so if we've been gifted and blessed to have good teachers who really transmitted the practice with clarity and intention and devotion, then we show up like that as well for ourselves and our students. And it sounds like that's where you're coming from. Yes. And I really, I'm grateful for the teachers today too, that are holding on to that, excuse me, you know, true yoga, that heartfelt yoga and ones that are recognizing, wow, I can do better. Right. Or oh shit, <laughs> let's look at this in this way now and are humbled by it, right? I think we've all had moments like that as um, wellness uh, leaders to say, right? For sure. Yeah, and I really think, you know, being in a class with people that are in such different spaces, I think it's so important to just allow people to be themselves. If someone needs to get up and leave, you know, I always tell people, like, if you just want to lay here and take a nap, listen to what your body needs, right? And you, you hear often, you're not your body, but your body tells the story of your entire life. <laughs> there is so much being communicated from each cell into our hearts and brains, and we need to listen. Yoga is like, a, to me, it's like a deep listening, right? It's a deep listening. And again, it's not just the asana. And I think here in the Western world, we missed the boat <laughs> like 10 years ago. And and a lot of people got really obsessed with the movement because especially in our country, we just want to go, 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 go. And really the most important aspects of yoga are the breath work, the pranayama, are the meditation, are the self-inquiry practices, right? The yamas and niyamas. I mean, those to me are some of the most um, juicy uh, work to get into, right? Learning about ourselves, self-reflection. And then really creating a body that is okay when you say a sanctuary that is a place where you want to be, a place that you can find calm, a place that you can experience the full range of your emotions from joy to deep sorrow and everywhere in between. Right? It's so important to honor each one and not skip over them, right? Not skip over those emotions because then they just get stored and maybe you'll never be able to live your or lift your arm over your head until you deal with a trauma or an emotion, right? That's stuck. So there's such a beauty, I think, to yoga that is deeper than, I think the practice is doing the work from the inside out that maybe we won't even recognize for years to come. It's just happening. Yeah. 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 That in itself is just, it feels so comforting when you say that. It's just dropping back within and it isn't this forceful, aggressive way of moving the body and Jeanette this is something that you know I've admired and 
respected your work for years because you are an advocate for that as well. That, and even in a recent conversation this summer, you had said, although we live in a very hot, humid climate during the summer, our body is really meant to practice more of a, a restorative yin approach because we don't need to build more of that fire. And for both of you, uh, you've honored your own physical bodies and worked with that in the way of of honoring your practice. And Crystal, even just you know knowing a bit about what you've experienced in the past few years, physically having to adapt and adjust, and and holding steady in that, and not forcing your body to move at a pace that it wasn't ready for. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and I think too, you know, your body needs different things at different times. And in a yoga class, we don't always get that option, right? And if we look back to where yoga began, a lot of the asana was designed for teenage um, teenage boys <laughs> um, with a certain type of very thin, um, long body. And especially when you look at the bowl of the pelvis and the pelvic floor, um, a lot of what we learned to keep our feet together and be very narrow and taut and um, strong and, and linear is, um, is beautiful, but that's not what works for a woman's body, for a female um, and her organs <laughs> and, and her bones and her muscles and all of this. And so over the years learning, um, not only to deal with a major car accident injury that I had, but to look at what I was doing before that and understanding that I needed to change it dramatically because what I was doing before the accident wasn't actually good for my body. You know, throwing my feet together and being on this little off angle, you know, as women, we need our feet under our hips aligned with the bowl of our pelvis so we can have the real foundation and support that we need to not wreak havoc on all of the different muscles of the pelvic floor, or the inner thighs or the groin area, right? So what I'm trying to get at <laughs> is, it's so important to understand where your feet need to be in a yoga practice in alignment with the type of body that you have. And from there, you know, when you come upon a situation where if you're in any sort of traumatic accident or have some sort of injury to slow down and reassess what it is that you need to do. I mean, I went from teaching uh, very, um, say intense, but very fluid and a little bit quick vinyasa flow, which I actually had such a love for having a growing up being a dancer my whole life. Um, I loved that really sweet, swift flowing movement, which is still um, what I love, but I've had to change into something so much slower, more articulate, more particular and, and careful, right? I think it's so important to be careful and be caring with our bodies and not beat them up. We, you know, in the Western world, we're running and going to the gym and doing all these things that are very staccato energy, right? And in the yoga practice, what I have felt inside of my being on a spiritual level is very soft and peaceful and fluid. And so bringing that feeling from the inside out, especially after a lower back injury was so important to go slow and be nurturing and care about what I'm doing. Right. And, and for a while, um, I felt so depressed and in the dark because I couldn't do this posture or that posture anymore. And I mean, I couldn't even do a forward fold for like four to five months. And with that, the blessing is, is that I got into the breath work even more, the pranayama practice. And I, I just would do one or two postures with a deep breath and that was enough, right? I didn't need this whole big fancy thing to feel what I needed to feel like the gifts of yoga, for sure, for sure. And at that time I had so much trauma, I couldn't sit down and meditate. I couldn't close my eyes, I couldn't do those things. There was no way I would hear the sound of the car crunching. I would, you know, feel the pain in my lower back and I just I had to let go. I actually had to stop trying to do yoga. <laughs> and I had to let the yoga like do me. I had to let the ancient, beautiful spirited practices, like the soul of yoga, just hold me mm -hmm. by, you know, taking slow walks, listening to the trees and the birds and feeling the wind, because all of that is 
it's yoga, right? All of life is yoga. So yeah, having to change it was a blessing. <laughs> I love that so much. Mm -hmm. I have a similar experience through injury and accident and it led me down a whole new path. It's like, it's a totally different story when your body is not your sanctuary. And the, the welcoming back home that you can receive when you tune into the things that are timeless, like our connection with nature, our connection with our breath, um, reading sacred scriptures, you know, whatever it is that brings you home to that sense of innate peace, even in the midst of suffering. I think yoga gifts us with the fact that that is possible. So thank you so much for sharing about your journey with it. It's so beautiful. Yeah, no, thank you. And I think, um, you know, through the last few years, the, the, the global and personal traumas of this crazy pandemic, I think we're all here to find, and Kate, you use this word all the time. I think we even called one of our retreats, you know, simple beauty. We're coming back to the most simple ways of, you know, nurturing our bodies, our lives, and each other. I mean, there is so much to be found in the sacredness of the mundane everyday life. The, 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 the magic is really in that, in that mundane um, way of being and living. It, mundane is like this funny twinge to it, and some people think it's boring, but it's so, so, so potent. I yeah. love it. The sacred yeah. and the mundane. Would you give us an example of something mundane that, and how to weave in the sacred? Yeah, I mean, I think it's about presence, right? And that's what yoga, everything that yoga is designed to do at the at that eighth limb, maybe step between seven and eight. It's just the, yeah, about being present. <laughs> it's like it seems so complicated to get there, but it's just. And I have the chills. Just you know, okay. So just an example. I got to see Stevie Nicks, you know, and I know that's music, so maybe not so mundane. But I mean, I got to see her on Saturday night, and. I was standing by the ocean, you know, the, the evening was so beautiful, my feet in the sand, the stars above, and she's singing um, landslide, you know, and I'm just hands up in the sky, just letting all of these beautiful things move through us. And I think when we're present with any mundane moment, no matter where you are, if you let the magic of that moment move through you, then you're in a state of bliss, which is the eighth limb of yoga, right? And even, even Stevie Nicks said it, she was, you know, in these, I don't even know. She looked like the witchiest, most magical woman. And I don't even know how she's 70 something, but she's in this witchy dress and all of these ribbons are flowing from her. And the wind was just right. And she got on the stage and she said, the wind almost shut the concert down. She goes, but it was working for me all night. And that was it. Like her and that wind. And then she just 70 something, you know, singing like the goddess that she is. And so if you're at a Stevie in a concert or if you're just sitting at home on the couch with your mom, right? When she's sick, my mom just was sick again the last week. And, you know, just looking at her and realizing like, oh my God, she drives me crazy, but I love her so much, you know? And just watching TV with the person that you love and cooking them a meal, that's also the most mundane yet magical gift, right? It's an offering to each other. I love that. And it is, you know, just simplifying the busyness. It builds such an appreciation for all of that. And then life can become so much less complex with what we look to outsource our, our happiness and our gratitude and just the simple, simple pleasures of, of how nature and teach us so much how we can be, we are of nature, but be so connected and so alive, even when we feel really heavy or we're sick or we feel laden with grief. It's all coming back to the center, coming back to the heart and relishing in all that's there. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I think too, just like you said, the word alive, it's about being alive, even in the moments where you might feel dead, <laughs> right? And I mean, I think too, through the honoring of your emotions and every range of them, that's being alive. Being alive isn't just being joyful, right? I mean, yes, we want to 
feel more of these really wonderful and nourishing things, but you know, anger and grief, they're not bad, right? It's moving them through. And so whether that's walking, you know, connecting, dancing, doing the yoga. And again, back to yoga, they have these eight limbs where they're, it's really, it's a beautiful, it's a beautiful um, practice, science. Um, there's so many things I feel like I could call yoga <laughs> for what it is. And a part of that is the movement, but we can't forget about those moments of um, stillness and contemplation and connection, right? It's about connection within ourselves and everything around us all the sentient beings of the world and the plants, animals, all of that. Mm -hmm. Yoga chitta vritti nirodaha. <laughs> that idea of when, when the mind slows down, becomes still, that is the state of yoga. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that is what like presence and weaving the sacred into the mundane allows us and gives us is the true state of our being. Yeah, mm -hmm. coming home to that, to bliss, to connection with all that is an awareness of what is our true nature. Mm -hmm. So, such a gift. So beautiful. Thank you for um, being able to say that so beautifully. I was never, I was never that good at the Sanskrit. So thank you for saying it so beautifully. Is when you said that, I could just so much came back through me of being in San Francisco and studying in New York and just really remembering how all of these uh, beautiful yoga sutras and the different mantras I've learned over the year that, gosh, they're so beautiful. Is there just a, a, a call or a cry or, um, or sometimes just a, a, the simple um, song of the mantra and how that can change the frequency of our whole being? you know, and with the teaching inside of each syllable and the way that you get to move your tongue across the roof of your mouth and in the Sanskrit and how that's actually changing your brain. There's so much that we could get into. And I think too, many times I'm asked, you know, is there are people in, in the world that come to yoga of all different kinds of uh, religious backgrounds, right? And it's, Yoga to me is such a, uh, a neutral ground for all and any religions to come together and, and practice. And I don't think that it exiles any uh, belief or faith. And I also, I, I pray that yoga is seen um, as something that adds to any um, type of religion or belief as well. And that it is a way to feel God in your heart because I felt it so many times. <laughs> it's a way to, it's really a, a beautiful way to cleanse your heart, to be open to God's love, goddess love. Um, yeah, I mean, that divine energy is what we allow and make space for it to move through in the practice. And there doesn't need to be a name attached to that. It's just universal love and let that shit flow through because we all need it, you know? Yeah. yeah. You, you've reminded me of so much in this conversation. So thank you. And I really hope that our listeners can just sink into whatever is extracted piece by piece, because I feel like when we listen back to this, there'll be so many great reminders and in all of what you just shared, if someone were listening and they are not familiar with a practice of, of we're, we're using the guise of yoga, but yoga is life. What is one practice that you hold really close to your heart that you would invite anyone to begin to tune into? Maybe mindfulness or anything that resonates. Does that, yeah. does that make sense? Absolutely. Um, and, you know, instead of thinking about it too much, I'm just going to go with what came into my heart and my mind. And it might sound so silly, but Shavasana just, just, I just feel, I just feel like that's what we need. And so Shavasana is the last posture that you do in a practice before any meditation, after the asana. 
and it's the most restful uh, posture that 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 you can take, I would say. Um, and if you can do it <laughs> on the ground outside on the earth, that would be absolutely amazing. Um, putting on some really lovely um, soothing music or and just listening to the sounds of nature, but getting your body on the floor, on the ground, maybe with a pillow, something comfortable for, you know, setting a timer for 10 minutes and allowing the body some rest, some true um, art of doing nothing, right? Because most of the times we're either sleeping when we're lying down or if we're laying down during the day, we're on our phone, right? So this like clear phoneless moment of deep rest, I think would be one of the best practices to, or gifts to give ourselves in, in these times, right? So just lying down and finding, or even a guided meditation or something along the way, but being able to lie down and receive the gift of the sky, the earth and relaxation. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I agree a thousand percent with that. And I um, just would love to add one little note that Shavasana is a practice for death. It's a practice of, of dying, releasing our hold on our physical bodies. So that is probably the most epic gift we can give ourselves is to do that on a regular basis. Um, thank you for sharing. Yes, beautiful. No, thanks for that reminder too. It's often not um, talk, talked about. So yes, letting everything that happened the moments before, years before, just go. And it's like a rebirth, right? For sure. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. I'm just so grateful to um, have had this practice find me. I always say that if, you know, if, if yoga has found you or you found yoga, it's usually yoga finding you that, you know, you're probably the person in your family doing most of the healing and you're going to help everyone else get, you know, inspired to do their own healing. So, yeah. And thank you ladies so much for having me today. I just love and respect and honor um, both of your deep wisdoms and the work that you do for this world. It's really, it's just really special and so needed. And I just feel like a lucky woman to be here today. It's mutual. Thank you. Yeah. We're such a, it's such a joy to have you here and to get to know you more and to hear more about what you're doing. Would you mind sharing anything coming up? What are you working on in this moment? Sure. What's inspiring so, you today? Yeah. So um, I started over the summer, two, two different things. So I was teaching at this beautiful farm sanctuary in Bayville. It's called Runaway Farm. It is... Um, a place where this beautiful couple and their children have adopted or taken in uh, animals that didn't have a home or animals that were being abused or animals that just needed some love. A lot of the animals were actually runaways. They found a cow in their woods. <laughs> so they, Luna, she's super beautiful. And over the summer, we were doing yoga there to uh, raise money for the farm and to just have the experience of, you know, practicing outside in nature with the cicadas and the crickets and the grass and the blue sky and the mooing of the cows and the running by of the horses and the cute little goats looking at us, figuring out what we were trying to do. <laughs> it's not goat yoga, but it's just, you know, us in um, this beautiful pasture and all the animals are just watching. And by the time we're in Shavasana, they're all asleep, which is amazing. Mm -hmm. um, and so we'll be doing a couple of things this fall. So this Thursday, we're doing a, um, an, an autumn equinox. I almost said summer solstice, but we're, we're in the autumn. <laughs> Autumnal equinox gathering. And the week after we're doing a ladies night with um, a little fireside art and a little music and some um, movement and intention setting. So that'll be really sweet. And I've also started to teach and I'll be taking a course this fall, um, special needs yoga. And over the summer, I taught my first class with my girlfriend and her, um, her kids at Central Regional and I, I don't know if my heart was ever more full after a class. And so I'm really, really excited to start that part of my yoga teaching journey. Um, a lot of the students, you know, are, some of them are nonverbal. Some of them um, 
have physical ailments, they might not be able to do some of the postures and things. So we really modify what we can. We make it fun. We dance in the middle. We have these fun pom-poms. And we also did this beautiful feather breathing, which is so good for kids to just notice their breath on a really colorful feather. My favorite part was at the end when I asked them to put their hands on their heart, each and every single one of them understood that gesture and they know where their heart is. And when I'm with those kids, I, I feel their hearts. And so that's where I'm going with it. I'll also be baking some wedding cakes and, you know, I think the three of us should definitely do something before the winter. So yeah. And how can people find you? Um, the best place to find me is on Instagram or Facebook. My Instagram is at Crystal Dawn Love. And on Facebook, it's Crystal Dawn Froberg, where we have all of our events. And I'll eventually get a website one day, I think. <laughs> oh, yeah. Thank you. We'll put everything in the show notes. And um, yeah, I just feel so honored and overjoyed to have this time with you today. So thank you. Me too. Me too. Thank you, ladies, so much. Thank you, Crystal, for just sharing so much of your light. Thank you for having me. 